welcome you all to this uh, course on electron diffraction and imaging. In the last class, we talked about the structure of a microscope, what all components microscope have, okay, little bit about the ray diagrams, how the images are formed, okay, at back focal plane as well as at the image plane. But another aspect which is very important is resolution of a microscope, okay. Then the other is about what are different modes in which the microscope could be operated. Then the depth of field and depth of uh, 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 depth of field and depth of focus, which is also important for a microscope. These are all the aspects which I will cover in today's class. Okay. The first thing is uh, before we talk about the resolution of a microscope, what do we mean by resolution? Okay. In most of the uh, instruments, especially like in an optical microscope, the resolution we generally write with that formula r equals 0 0.61 lambda by I think n into or n, n is what is called as a numerical aperture, correct? This is for a camera or a lens where all the aberrations have been corrected. That is, this is something similar to for an ideal microscope, okay, or a perfect microscope, we say that for a point object, it does not produce a point image, okay. Let us look at how this comes. Normally, an ideal microscope, if you consider, is the one where for a each point on that object, we should have a point image, okay. That normally does not happen from this formula, okay. How does it occur? Let us consider the case okay, here, the light is coming from an object which is very far away which we can consider it as a point and it is a parallel beam. A lens is one which is focusing it onto the screen. Okay. In this case, how does that intensity comes? Normally we know that instead of the lens we could have an aperture also, that does not matter. But when that aperture size is large when the light comes from far away, we get a shadow of that object in that image. Nothing that you make the aperture smaller and smaller, the shadow becomes uh, uh, smaller and smaller. That is what it happens. Is that is what is going to happen when the aperture becomes very small and of the order of the size of the wavelength of the radiation? That is what the question which arises. Because when we operate microscopes, where we are looking at resolutions, okay, or looking at objects, which are at close to or the resolution which are very close to a wavelength of the radiation. Let us look at what happens in that case. In all these cases, though we can draw a ray diagram, like if it is a source is there, if you have an aperture, we can draw a ray diagram and this is the aperture. We can tell that at this point, on the screen we are going to get an image, with this sort of a ray diagram we could describe that image. That is what essentially it is being done. But quite often we know that that is not the truth because here we consider light as a corpuscular one. Light essentially in most of the cases we have to consider it as a wave, okay. If we consider it as a wave, then the intensity at every point depends upon contribution from various points how it, add, how it adds to it that is essentially the phase difference between okay, different rays which are reaching at a point that decides the net amplitude and that is what is going to decide the intensity. That way if you look at it okay, at a point which is going to be at the center of the light ray this lens, these two rays will have the same path length and they will all add together. But let us move away from it. Then what is going to happen? The ray which is going to come from here or the ray which is going to come from here, they have different path lengths. At some particular distance, we find that the path, uh, the path difference becomes lambda by 2, then this is a destructive interference. That is where the intensity falls off and reaches a value, small value. Okay. This is what essentially if you try to image this, we can immediately see that we have a bright central spot then a dark region, then and again a subsidiary maxima and minima, this is how we get. This is called as a frontal diffraction, okay, or this is called as an airy disk. In this case, 
qualitatively what happens is that if you look at it, if you make the size of the aperture small or the lens size itself you can make it small because the lens size is something like an aperture because only that size which focuses the beam onto the uh, screen the others are all going as a parallel ray. Okay. As the aperture size becomes smaller and smaller what we can see in the image which is shown here is that the central disk size is becoming larger. This is contrary to what we expect normally as the aperture becomes small the image size should become small and it becomes large now we do not know how do we relate it to the aperture size. Okay. This is what essentially this Rayleigh formula what it is the Rayleigh's criterion what it says is that from here to here if you see this distance okay, the central maximum to the first minimum that gives the radius of this disk and that is equal to some factor 1.22 lambda into f by d comes f is the focal length of the lens and d is essentially nothing but the aperture size this essentially gives that angle beta also essentially what we can make out from this is that as the aperture for a constant focal length of the lens as the d becomes smaller and smaller that aperture makes smaller and smaller r becomes larger and larger what we explain qualitatively the same thing is becoming clear from this expression which we derive it for the uh, for a point object using a small aperture whose uh, size is of the order of wavelength okay how they will give in an image okay the radius of the image okay this is all based on what we call it the physical optics the ray diagram is also there but other than that we have to incorporate the wave nature of light and another aspect which you have to do is this and the Huygens principles, Huygens principles has to be used that is what it tells that from every point when the light propagates it comes as a spherical wave okay. as they join together they form a uh, uh, wave front again from every point on the wave front again uh, uh, spherical wavelets are emanated okay. that is how the propagation takes place and the one front which is normal to the propagation that is what we call it as the ray that is if waves are like this all the waves crusts are joining together okay, at one wave front and this we call wave front and the direction which is normal to this wave front is the ray diagram which we draw. Though we draw the ray diagram to explain most of the things we should remember that when we have to explain how the intensities when or when we wanted to quantify that information we have to use the wave nature of life or the path difference that means that the light itself or the probe itself has to be considered as a wave which is coming okay, and or a wave which is propagating okay. This we consider with respect to one point that means that even for one point without any aberration of the lens we do not get a point image we get essentially a size say, which we call it as an iris disk okay. Now let us consider a case where are two sources are there which are independent of each other from both of them we will be getting a airy disks like this okay. Then how are we able to differentiate them if these two are very far away at two different places they will be coming. So this airy disk we can see as two distinct ones here. Now if uh, this separation between the object is brought closer together the disks also will come together at some point they merge and still we can see them as distinct but when the separation becomes smaller than that we are not able to see them as a separate disk we just observe them as a single disk okay that means that this feeling which we get is will vary from uh, eye to eye of a person it is not going to be the same generally the variation in intensity may be about uh, less than 15 percentage is going to be difficult for our eye to resolve okay. So if the separation is such that between the middle and the other regions if the intensity is uh, dips by 15 percentage we can see that is what the rally criterion is all about. So this is from uh, this schematic diagram which has been shown if you see that this distance x by 2. So how we define is that first the central maximum of 1 to where the next one that image of it when comes the central maximum 
comes as the at the uh, first zero of the uh, uh, central maximum of the first object. This separation we call it as the resolution of the equipment or this is the separation between the objects which can be resolved okay, for this particular wavelength of the radiation. So, we can see that this distance r equals this derivation one can do it and this turns out to be 0 0.1 lambda by sin i with respect to the way it is being drawn. Otherwise, normally we use for the angle which the object makes with the lens as maximum angle as beta then we can write it as 0 0.61 lambda by sin beta and what mu is essentially nothing but the refractive index of the medium. In an electron microscope the refractive index uh, is 1. So, and the angle beta is small. So, it can be written as just 0 0.61 lambda by beta. This is how it comes. Okay. This is for a lens which is perfect. So, for a point object one should remember that we do not get a point image even other only an airy disc which we get it. Okay. And if we use a lens and separation between two objects this is the way what the formula is going to be. This is what we call it as the Rayleigh criterion for resolution. Okay. Then about the magnification I had already mentioned. Now, uh, let us look at but no lens is perfect. So, all lenses have some aberrations associated with it. What will be the effect of that aberration on the uh, first image which it creates. So, for a point object as we started with telling that for an ideal lens a point image should be formed. That does not occur and the Rayleigh criterion tells what that value should be and that turns out to be this by beta. This is what that first criterion. And then the lenses have different type of aberrations. The one which is most important is what we call it as the spherical aberration of the lens, uh, spherical aberration. What is spherical aberration? Uh, is the rays which are traveling parallel uh, which are traveling closer to the optic axis, they are focused at some point and the rays which are traveling away from the optic axis, they are focused at different points. This gives rise to on the image plane, okay, a broad image. Okay. That is what is shown in this slide. This essentially comes because whenever we uh, use uh, geometrical optics to find out where an image will be formed for an object kept at a particular place in the lens. Okay. The first criterion we assume that the rays are paraxial rays. What a paraxial ray essentially means is that the incident angle and the refracted angle is extremely small. Okay. Because any ray which enters into a lens, it has to be refracted and that is how it is being brought to a focus. So, the refraction is given by the formula okay, mu equals generally we write sin i by sin r. Okay. When this angle i and r are very small, okay, we can make sin i equals i sin r equals r. So, then this becomes mu equals i by r. This is what only for small angles this a condition is satisfied. Otherwise, normally that sin i if we wanted to write, we can write it as an expression i minus i cube by 3 factorial plus i to the power of 5 by 5 factorial. This is the sort of a series in which it has to be done. Then only it will be exact value. So, we have uh, for small values of phi, it is very close to sin i. That is how we, this is the approximation which is responsible for this aberration because in a ray tracing, we assume paraxial rays, but in an actual lens it is not paraxial rays that is why we see this spherical aberration. So, if, if we have to avoid this effect due to spherical aberration, if you put an aperture and cut off all the rays which are far away from the optic axis, then we can reduce the spherical aberration. Okay. So, this finally what it leads to for a point object is spread in image at the image plane. Chromatic aberration also does that same, but chromatic aberration has nothing to do with the lens. We should always remember that chromatic aberration is to do with the wavelength of the radiation, non monochromaticity of the beam that is what is mainly responsible for. There are other def uh, lens defects are there like astigmatism, coma, okay, radius of curvature, all these things. We will come to it shortly. So, essentially, because of the aberration, 
the solution is affected okay. So even for a lens which does not have any aberration there is a spread this adds to it. So the total sum total what is going to now decide that aberration. So for a point the object itself so whatever is the spread which we get it is due to spherical aberration plus the Rayleigh criterion okay. So here what we are doing it is schematically trying to show or qualitatively or pictorially I wanted to explain how the aberration makes the reduce uh, makes the resolution worse okay. See for a point object for a lens what it does it is this is what the image which it is going to create okay. This is what the image are. here what is being done is that I have taken this is for a object single object which is a point. Suppose I have two point objects are there which are separated by a distance which is quite large then each one of them I will be getting an image in the image plane which is going to be like this okay. This is what essentially we get for both of them and since the two point objects are well separated now if you look at it these images are separated and at some critical distance they touch each other but now the intensity maximum is here and it fades off so we can see them as two distinct points. Now there is a particular critical distance between the object if we consider objects which are still closer then there is at some critical distance now we can see that the disks overlap. When the disks overlap at the center if we see it if the intensity variation is uh, from the center to the middle of this between the spots if it becomes less than 85 percentage we will be able to that from this we can make out that aberrations okay worsens the resolution. Here we have considered only just the spherical aberration because that is the one of the which is most important okay and in fact uh, as we go we will see that this makes the resolution 100 times uh, worse compared to what a rally criterion describes okay. Laddick criterion dictates okay. What are the aberrations which we have in a lens which is inherent to a lens spherical comma okay that is for half axis ray that what will be the effect of the spherical aberration that is comma astigmatism because the non planarity of that lens curvature of the field because there for an object which is uh, perpendicular to the optic axis we do not have to get an image in a one particular plane it may be curved that is one another is distortion of the image which occurs okay. How do we quantify this for as far as the Rayleigh criterion we have looked at it if you know the wavelength of the radiation what is the angle which the beam submits with the lens this uh, the size of the area disk okay turns out to be 0 0.61 lambda by beta. Spherical aberration what it does it for a point object this gives C s to the beta to the power of cube okay. That means that this C s is the spherical aberration coefficient okay. What does uh, chromatic aberration do? it is uh, beta into delta f which is the defocus which it creates okay. And all these effects if we consider it is that all of them the image distribution if you look at the image plane is essentially from the center there is a variation this variation is essentially considered to be something like a Gaussian distribution. If you take a Gaussian distribution many of these peaks which are adjacent okay one Gaussian peak and then we have an another Gaussian peak which comes like this the total effect if you wanted to consider with respect to standard deviation is square of the standard deviations have to be added together and take a square root that will give the standard deviation of the overall effect that is what essentially is being done here. So this d equals d a squared okay the R, this is dr by square okay corresponding to Rayleigh criterion this corresponds to spherical plus this is due to chromatic. Since chromatic comes from the monochromaticity of the beam we assume that we are able to make a beam perfectly monochromatic then these two are the ones which are essentially going to decide the aberration they decide the resolution okay. We can write it like this substitute these values but if you look at the variation here it is inverse of beta okay here it is beta cube. So we can optimize it and found out for what value of beta we will get the minimum uh, the best resolution that is that we can obtain by differentiating okay 
and then do it then the beta value turns out to be 0 0.61 lambda by C s root 3 the whole to power of 1 4 and we can also find out what is going to be the from one point to another point in that object what separation which we can measure this is lambda to power of 3 by 4 and C s to power of 1 by 4. That means that small variations in lambda can bring about a lot of variation in the resolution okay. And in fact here I am just showing the value which has been calculated for a 200 kV electrons where lambda is of the order of 0 0.0025 nanometer okay. Then the point to point resolution which we can obtain for the image of, uh, of the object turns out to be 0 0.2 nanometers. So, it is 100 times worse than what the Rayleigh criterion dictates. So, this simple derivation shows okay how exactly one can calculate what will be the effect of different aberrations on the resolution okay. And in fact, decreasing lambda we can improve the resolution that is what was done initially and that is how people started making uh, high voltages microscope there 1 million volt microscope, 3 million volt microscope, 2 million volt microscope where resolution becomes much better okay. The other option which has been adopted now is that if you can make the spherical aberration small with the same normal operating voltage you can still get the best resolution okay. Those microscopes are called as aberration corrected microscopes okay. So, far now we have uh, talked about the resolution how to calculate the resolution for a lens which has an aberration okay. Now I mentioned about depth of field and depth of focus okay. These are also inherent property of a lens okay. Not only a lens it is also associated with the inherent property of the recording device as well okay. Because the best example which we can take is that when we take a picture using a camera okay, we often see in that picture that people or the objects at different positions in the object field they are all in focus okay. Only some distance beyond which you find that again it becomes hazy okay. Similarly on the focal plane also in fact there is some distance over which even if we move the uh, CCD camera or the film still the image will be image will appear in focus okay. Uh, I am using the word appear because it is essentially a, a feeling which we get it on that basis we decide. I will talk about why I use that word appear. This is just a picture which I have uh, taken of some cows which are grazing in a field. If you look at it the cows which are at different positions they are all in focus but far away it is out of focus. The distance over which this is in focus we call it as the depth of uh, the, the distance over which the object is in focus is defined as the depth of field. Similarly on the image the distance over which the image is in focus is called as the depth of uh, focus okay. To understand this we should just get an understanding about our eye itself. How do we perceive an object and see that they are in focus okay. This is because finally in our eye we have a lens and the retina which is there. The retina is the one which is able to sense the light radiation which comes and sense that information to our brain and an image is being formed okay. How does the retina look like? that is the most critical part of it. These photoreceptors are essentially what is called as rods and cones. If you look at this picture this is essentially nothing but like some small segments okay which are connected together. Each one of them okay is a separate photo sensor whatever is the intensity of the radiation which falls on to it the whole thing is collected together it considers that some intensity which has come okay. That means this has a finite size this is exactly what happens in the case of a CCD camera also where we call each of them we will be calling them as pixels. Pixels have some finite size in the case of our eye these cones have got about uh, something like 
4 to 5 micron squared is the size which they have. So, suppose we assume that that is the finite size of one such pixel or we call a cone which is there. So, if this is that size, if you have an object which is here, the ray which comes and enters here, okay, it gets focused here and this whole thing is this falling on one pixel, it is counted. Suppose the object is uh, uh, the focal uh, its focus being that object is at this particular point when the ray comes this ray also okay will be forming an image at the back because essentially what happens is that the eye this is the lens the ray which comes like this it forms at this particular point if this is the pixel size the ray which comes from here this what it will do it will focus it at this particular point in front of it and still if you see it the ray which is coming from here though this is focused here all the rays which are coming from this which are captured by the eye uh, by the lens is essentially reaching this pixel okay so as far as our eye is concerned that entire information has come whether object is here or here or if that object I keep it here then what it can happen is that it may come like this it may be forming. So, this also all the so that means that because of the finite size of the detector which we use it the rays are being captured. So, there is a distance over which if we move beyond this what is going to happen is that the rays will be going beyond this and to other pixels. So, this pixel there is a reduction in intensity then we say that we are not able to see that as a sharp object. So, this is how images are formed ok. Because of this what is essentially is going to happen is that there is a distance over which the object appears in focus and in this distance also if we can move it from here to here it does not matter where we keep the spoon over this distance image is always going to appear as the uh, in focus. So, this is called as depth of focus, this is called as the depth of field ok. Here this is just showing that I when we go far away from the center of the retina then the cones are going to decrease and that what is called as uh, rods are there. The rods are the ones which are highly sensitive for night vision that is are under dim radiation and the cones are the ones which collect for that uh, intense radiation and the color sensitivity is there in the cone. This is going into a different area so I will not talk about it now ok. So, the same way if we have an object here ok even if it is focused in front or if it is that same ray if it is focused below behind or if it is focused here because of maybe the lens problem still it is going to be uh, collected for this particular distance as as if it is in focus. So, this is called as the depth of focus. In the case of a uh, uh, CCD that each pixel size that will decide at what distance the depth of focus is going to be there ok. And here what I have done is that so far I talked about with respect to depth of focus ok and the depth of field and how do we relate it to uh, the solution that is something which we have to look at it because does it affect the resolution ok. Let us take this case here ok for a this is an object plane uh, and this is the lens it forms an image in this plane. If by because of some, some lens aberration you assume that the uh, this point is we are trying to focus it somewhere here. So, if you are trying to focus it here if you look at the ray diagram it looks as if the ray from here is coming like this, ray from here is coming like this and it is forming an image here. That means that this distance which is called as the D0, this distance what is within this we cannot see ok. This is what it limits the resolution ok. And similarly from here also one is an over, the over focus if it is an under focus if you do it that same thing which happens. So, between 
So, we can now decide what is the area on the object which we wanted to resolve then depending upon that we can find out what over focus and under focus regions which are going to be in a focus okay. That essentially tells us that there is for a particular resolution or the particular separation between the objects which we wanted to resolve very clearly there is a particular distance over which they are in focus. That means, if you use a sample of a thickness which is only of this particular size for a specific resolution we will be able to see all the region in focus. This is what the consequence of it ok. Similarly, in the image also we can find ok for that same uh, separation between the objects what is the distance over which the image will be in focus because we are using a CCD camera with some specific resolution or even if we with it or look at with our eye it is finally, it behaves exactly like a CCD camera pixels of a CCD camera ok. Here what I have done is that for one particular object separation I have shown it ok. What is going to be the separation uh, for that is for the resolution of that object on the sample if you wanted to have what should be the uh, depth of foc uh, foc uh, depth of field and for which what will be the depth of focus ok. Now, what I have done it is here I have made the resolution much more stringent or means that the separation between the objects which I wanted to be resolved is made smaller. Then you can see that the uh, depth of field has reduced similarly the depth of focus has also reduced ok. This is essentially all a qualitative ray diagram, but how do we quantify it ok. For quantification I will not go into a derivation, but I am just giving some formulas. So, this angle beta is essentially given by if you look at this particular diagram what is the object size which we wanted to see ok. To from the ray diagram we can make out that this is the separation for the over focus and the under focus condition ok where within which this uh, this much region will be in focus okay. this we can see it for the image plane also finally then we know what the magnification of that lens okay substituting this we get some formula for that d image that is what the depth of uh, uh, focus or the depth of image is what the object size divided by the angle which it makes with respect to the lens okay and the magnification squared at that time. Similarly, the depth of object equals ok this distance where that object is in focus is given by what is the resolution which we are looking divided by the angle which that object submits with the lens. This if you do a simple calculation suppose we say that this d object I put 0 0.2 nanometer because I want a resolution of 0.2 nanometer in the sample. Then if the beta equals 10 milli rad then the d object turns out to be 20 nanometers. That means, that sample of only 20 nanometer size only we have to use it if you want very clear the full sample to be image. Suppose the sample size is larger others will give a diffuse background and the contrast will become much worse. That means, that when we want better and better resolution the sample has to be thinner and thinner that is the information. Okay. If I want about 2 nanometer then what happens is that this is about something like 200 nanometer. That means, that now the sample can be if I wanted to see precipitate size of 2 nanometers to be resolved not 0.2 nanometer then I can use a sample which is uh, 200 nanometer 2000 Armstrong thickness or 1000 Armstrong thickness which you can routinely prepare. So, now you can understand what essentially is the uh, difference. Similarly, for the same one I can calculate what is the depth of field in the image. So, here you can see that for 0.2 nanometer for a normal microscope it gives about something like uh, 50 meters. That means, that from the uh, image plane 25 meters up or 25 meters down the image is going to be in focus. If you place camera anywhere we will be able to form the image only thing is that the image will be magnified or demagnified depending upon whether we keep it in front of the uh, 
uh, image plane or at the back of that image plane. That is all which is going to happen. For 2 nanometers, this turns out to be 500 meters, still which is very large. Okay. So, now you can understand that what is the effect of this depth of field and depth of focus okay, and how it is related to the resolution. This is a very important factor in getting good images in the microscope and not only that this dictates that we should know what is the resolution with which we wanted to see depending upon that the sample has to be prepared and then also it tells that uh, uh, at what distances the recording device can be kept and image. So, the essential advantage is that because of this large uh, depth of uh, focus is that we can focus it at one region and that region we may not have sufficient space to keep a camera, we can keep it somewhere lower down or higher up and record it that is the greatest advantage in a microscope that is essentially what is uh, shown in this. So, within this region which we consider since the electron beam passes through that sample all the information in this region is in focus in the recording device. So, it is essentially a two dimensional that is the three dimensional information is projected and recorded in a two dimensional one this is like a perspective projection okay. that is what we get it here. Okay. But if the sample becomes very thick normally what happens is that this we talk about with respect to only just a uh, lens okay considering it as the characteristic of the lens with the particular uh, focal length okay and the wavelength of the radiation. But if the sample thickness becomes large two things one spherical aberration increases uh, chromatic aberration increases because as the beam passes through that sample okay lot of inelastic scattering will take place they will uh, spoil that image okay. So, this we have to take care of it okay for this purpose it is always better to have as thin as a sample as possible okay. So, far we have talked about resolution this one let us talk about contrast finally when we have to see some images there should be contrast. What is a contrast? Contrast is nothing but intensity variation from region to region if it can be perceived by our eye then we see that we are able to distinguish features. So, this we can this as from two regions if one I 2 minus I 1 by I 1 I will write it if it is I 1 is at one region another I 2 is this region in between these two regions if this variation in contrast delta I if this turns out to be less than 85 percentage our eye can very clearly see it okay. So, that is so now we have to look at uh, how contrast arises in a microscope okay. Suppose we keep a sample which is amorphous okay. In an amorphous sample what is essentially is going to happen if that if the sample is of uniform thickness as the beam passes through okay, because of different type of uh, uh, specimen beam interaction in the incident beam direction the intensity can get reduced. Okay. And if the thickness remains that same and the sample contains element of a particular type which is uniformly distributed it will be a uniform intensity we will be getting it as a background we will not see any contrast in that sample we can say. But if the thickness of the sample increases then the absorption will increase so this will give rise to reduction in intensity that means that if from one region to another region if there is a variation in intensity is going to be there in the sample okay that variation in intensity that is uh, if the, there is a variation in thickness of the sample and that will be reflected as variation in intensity now we can see as a contrast in that sample. Next if we look into a uh, region different regions contain different compositions or this region contains one element aluminum you assume that this region contains uranium. Then from in the, the one which contains high Z elements for the electron beam which enters this will be absorbed more for the same thickness. So, the intensity will be different. So, intensity will be varying from region to region this way also we can get contrast. 
So, this contrast we call it as a thickness contrast, this contrast variation from here to here we call it as a atomic number contrast. In most of the materials when we look at a microstructure different phases have different composition. So, both the thickness as well as the mass contrast both of them will be simultaneously occurring in the sample all the sample. This is what it happens in a case where we have not considered that, that the sample is diffracting because it is not a crystalline sample. Okay. Even in crystalline sample this should happen. What happens in the case of a crystalline sample? In the case of a crystalline sample the as the beam falls on that sample we consider the beam to be coherent beam okay. and since atoms are arranged in a periodic fashion at some scattering directions the intensity of the beam okay, for some angle if the planes are oriented in such a way that as the incident beam enters okay, for some direction the scattered beam intensity will be high for some directions you find the scattered intensity is less for other directions. That means that converse is in the primary beam direction as the beam passes through for some orientation of the sample the intensity of the primary beam is quite high as the sample is being tilted the intensity changes. That can happen because in a polycrystalline material different regions are oriented in different way with respect to a beam. So, we find that that intensity variation will come. Why this is occurring? This is because here the planes because especially in an electron microscope the Bragg angle is less than 1 degree. So, it is almost the planes which are parallel to a beam only give rise to diffraction. So, depending upon how the planes are oriented from region to region in a grain there will be a variation in intensity depending upon that in the transmitted beam also if you look along this direction you find that there is a variation which is going to happen. Suppose some defects are present. So, the defects also are regions where nothing but where the atoms are displaced from the correct lattice side that will also give rise to variation in the scattered intensity. So, that will also come as variation in uh, uh, in the, then this we call it as a contrast. So, the contrast arises in a crystalline material due to diffraction and this contrast effect could be very strong much more stronger than this uh, mass uh, thickness contrast. Okay. So, in all crystalline material the contrast is essentially coming from diffraction phenomena and in the diffraction phenomena we consider the beam to be a wave which is coming or even if you take as a ray what is the path difference which is introduced for the different rays coming to a particular point that is how we try to calculate the intensity at every point. This one should remember because that is the way all the quantification is carried out in a microscope. Okay. This is what essentially is explained here. Okay. Now, let us look at how do we form the image. Okay. The image which we can Form. We will consider as a ray diagram, okay, uh, which is shown here. If you look here, the beam which is scattered, it's a crystalline specimen. We are assuming it, okay. As the beam passes through the sample, at the back focal plane, we get the diffraction pattern. There is an image plane where we get that image, okay. And for other lenses which we use it, which one, okay? because now you have two planes are there the beams are converging. In the back focal plane they converge there the beams which are scattered in uh, from different points in that object okay, but in a particular direction they converge and image plane is one where the beams which are scattered from a particular point in different directions they converge. So, if you take the back focal plane as that object for further lenses we get the diffraction pattern on that screen. If we use the image plane, then we will be getting an image. Okay. One should learn how to draw these ray diagrams. This maybe I will take it as a, a tutorial where I will just tell you how ray diagrams have to be drawn okay, for lens system because this is very important to understand this because one should not. Uh, uh, try to remember this ray diagram from memory because I always expect it to be drawn because it will be a problem which will come from specific values. So, one cannot from memory draw ray diagrams. Okay. 
okay. Another important aspect which you have to consider is that okay, let us look at the diffraction. In a diffraction we assume that it is a parallel beam which is falling on that sample okay. As the beam falls on that sample okay, at the back focal plane we have the diffracted beam and in the image plane image is there okay. Since it is an electron beam okay, I can focus the beam to a very small size a parallel beam and fall it on a specific area and get a diffraction okay. But when I try to do it the intensity will get reduced considerably. Suppose I want a diffraction pattern from both the regions okay. Then either you play with the beam or I other way we can do it in front of the specimen keep a parallel beam put an aperture. Suppose that uh, uh, area of interest is about uh, 10 nanometer that means putting an aperture of 10 nanometer is very difficult as we have seen if you put an aperture of 10 nanometer there is a frontal diffraction effects are going to be there image will be clear. What is the other way we can do it? If you put an in the image plane if you put an aperture that is equivalent to putting a virtual aperture on the object plane which is demagnified. That way using a larger aperture we can effectively choose any area on the sample. This is what is this sort of diffraction when we do it we call it as a selected area diffraction. Okay, in a selected area diffraction we put an aperture in the image plane that decides from which area of the sample though the beam is falling on the large area which area of the sample is being chosen for diffraction. Okay. Suppose we choose an area which is essentially turns out to be one single grain. So from that grain we can get a single crystal diffraction pattern. Okay. Suppose that area which we choose contains more grains then the diffraction pattern from each of the grains will come and this is how a pattern will appear. You can see that com uh, complexity which is coming. If that aperture which we put it contains lot of grains with various orientations we assume that it is a random or all random orientations are possible then we will be getting essentially a ring pattern which is observed for nano crystalline uh, particles okay. So far I talked about diffraction with respect to a parallel beam. We can make the beam convergent we can make the beam divergent also will also give rise to some uh, the same type of a diffraction pattern or whether they give rise to some uh, special information okay. So far I talked about parallel beam when we do it the selected area diffraction this is with an aperture we can get a single crystal pattern or when the aperture size cannot be made very small if you want it from an extremely small area we can make a beam as a parallel beam and do a nano or micro diffraction in fact uh, specifically how it is being done is beam is made slightly convergent so that we can get a very fine beam okay. But apertures are not used that we can do it. The if the beam is being converged onto a sample it is as if simultaneously we are getting diffraction from beams which are falling on the sample at different orientations. So this sort of uh, diffraction if we take it this gives rise to a pattern which is like this where not only the 0 order uh, zone higher order Lavey zone also we can get simultaneously image this way almost the full reciprocal lattice the various reciprocal lattice sections we can get information about how the diffraction is occurring okay. From this we can get about the crystal structure point group space group determination all these things could be done this will be talked about in a separate lecture later. The divergent beam is when the beam falls onto the sample if a scattering is taking place inelastic scattering is taking place from a specific point that is the beam has lost some energy due to plasma oscillations. So from this region the beam is scattered in various directions this beam could be uh, diffracted by the planes. So it is a divergent beam which gets diffracted this pattern we call it as a Kikuchi diffraction pattern okay this is how it looks like and this Kikuchi diffraction patterns are very sensitive to sample orientation. So this could be used to find out whether the beam is exactly at the correct back condition or how much is the deviation to determine all this quantitative information we could use Kikuchi diffraction okay. This also will be talked about in a separate class okay. 
in a diffraction pattern if we look at it okay, from an amorphous region we get a ring pattern okay, and now you can see that if the thickness is that same we get a uniform contrast there is no variation and in a micro crystals we can get a ring pattern a diffraction pattern if you look at that image from region to region we can see that some regions are bright some regions are dark this is because how the crystals are oriented with respect to a incident beam. In a polycrystalline materials semblance of ring is there but we see spots in some rings but not continuous here also we can see the contrast when it is become grain becomes very large single crystal diffraction pattern and we can see the different grains and the second phase particles could be here all the contrast which is coming is because of diffraction effects. Okay. So far we talked about diffraction and we just showed some images these all these images are taken what we call it as a bright field image. What is a bright field image and there is a dark field image there are these are all the two things which you might have heard of. Okay. When a diffraction is taking place from a sample okay, if we cut off the rays which are scattered in other directions by putting an aperture at the back focal plane okay, where the diffraction pattern is formed then only this beam is which is if you magnify it we get that image which is called as a bright field image and if you put an aperture around this uh, diffracted beam and get the image this is equivalent to viewing the sample in this direction of the beam other various directions as if we view each of this direction gives different information and that is how we can get the information about that complete information about that sample. Okay. And generally what happens is that if we use this sort of a dark field the beam is away from the optic axis so the lens aberrations increase to reduce the lens aberrations we use a technique called as a centered dark field. What is done in a centered dark field essentially is that we uh, tilt the beam so that the diffracted beam is at the center and the direct beam is away. Okay. Using this we can get uh, images so this is what I am showing it here is a diffraction pattern which is taken from a gamma prime precipitates nickel based super alloys. You can see the central spot and there are weak super lattice reflections could be seen. I put an aperture around it and get an image and this is the bright field image where we can see this dark regions are the precipitates which are there. Now I put an aperture around this part this super lattice reflection now I can see the particles which are there and how they are distributed their particle size all this information which I can get it. In this particular case which I have considered there is only one type of a precipitate. There are cases where we can have more than one type of a precipitate. Here there are three variants of the same phase is there and choosing different diffraction spots taking dark field image I can identify how different variants are oriented in the matrix that information we could see it. This will be explained later in uh, detail in other classes. Okay. In this particular case if you consider the diffraction pattern because just what I am doing it is gradually increasing the complexity of the diffraction pattern. Here after analysis we find that there are two types of precipitates are there putting different uh, spots uh, that is putting aperture around different super lattice reflections. I could identify the various types of uh, precipitates and how they are distributed. Okay. It is easier said than done because this takes a lot of uh, effort to analyze this pattern okay. and uh, ja normally what we do it is that when we get a pattern like this you put apertures around it and get the images and then do the analysis later that is what is being done. But the whole thing takes quite a bit of time if we have uh, understand that uh, transformation taking place in the material and crystallography and an experienced electron microscopist one will be able to looking at the diffraction pattern one will be able to make out uh, which are the spots which you should use for getting dark field image. Essentially what you can make out is that using a bright field image we find that variation in contrast is there that tells that there could be different types of phases present. And 
if there are morphological differences which we see in the pattern because what may happen is that the region which we are seeing it some regions the precipitates appear like this in some precipitates have a different shape it is possible that this sort of shape may be due to another particle this by using dark field image okay we can try to find out what these precipitates are. Suppose I put a dark field image from some specific reflection if both of them belong to the same precipitate and they have the same orientation only the way they have been cut it appears then all of them will appear bright. So there are ways in which it has to be done okay that part of it is what is being covered in the practical electron microscopy and that is not what I am doing it in this class because here I am talking about essentially about the principles of electron microscopy and how the image formation. But in a brief nutshell what I wanted to tell that this is the way we form the uh, bright field and dark field images okay. In imaging also I talked about uh, a simple bright field and dark field from a parallel diffracted beam. In a parallel diffracted beam when we take it there are many ways in which it could be used okay. If we choose the beam in such a way okay that only the central spot is bright all other spots are weak I call it as a single spot imaging. In this case only one beam is strong and this condition we call it as a kinematical condition that means if all diffracted spots are weak okay essentially only one scattering event is taking place okay that is the condition under which we should do EDS or yields in a microscope okay this is the way it has to be done okay. And then other case is that we get a diffraction pattern symmetric choose only two beams central beam and an another beam by tilting that sample and this condition is called as a two beam condition. This is the condition which is used most of the time okay to get bright field or dark field or V beam image okay various types of images which are being formed. And specifically if you wanted to I did not find out the dislocation density it is better to use a multi beam asymmetric this one and put an aperture around the central beam then because we know that when a defect analysis is being done depending upon the which type of uh, G vector which is being used the defect can be a uh, present or it can be ab absent okay it is not the defect is present but the in the image we do not see it okay that does not mean that the defect is not there that is especially important for dislocation imaging that is where we have to be very careful about it. If you use a multi beam condition one may satisfy the G dot B equal 0 another will not because of that we will be able to image all the dislocations simultaneously so that we can get the true dislocation density. Even the parallel beam suppose we put an aperture around all the spots and then try to form an image okay this is what is being done is that then from different regions when the beam come and join together there is a phase difference which is created and this phase difference will come as a interference contrast this is called as a phase contrast microscopy and when multiple beam we use it this is what we call it as a some dot image pattern we get it this is called as a high resolution microscopy. This also will be all these aspects will be covered separately in different classes in detail okay. And if we can make the lens aberrations almost 0 or less okay and there are in a phase contrast microscopy there is a way to correct for that aberration make the aberration minimum so that we see this sort of pattern. And when that is chromatic uh, not chromatic when the spherical aberration is being made very small in such cases those microscopes are aberration corrected microscope they give an atomic resolution microscopy. There is an another type which I mentioned right at when we started in the last class that that is called an STEM. In STEM the beam can be made as small as possible about 0.1 uh, nanometer size. In such a case as the beam scans through that sample surface depending upon whether it is falling on an atom or in between atom positions there will be a variation in intensity. We can essentially we can map the atomic positions as we do in the case of scanning tunneling microscope or uh, atomic force microscopy okay. That is also give us uh, atomic resolution uh, images of the sample we can get it. These as all these different types of uh, imaging uh, techniques will be covered in later classes. 
what is the type of a sample holder which we use it there are various types of sample holders are available single tilt holder double tilt rotation and tilt heating holder straining holder so that there are various ways in which in situ microscopy could also be performed in the microscope itself okay and uh, keeping a sample in a double tilt or a rotation holder depending upon the tilt availability which is there we can uh, orient that crystal sample in whichever beam direction we want within the limits normally the tilt which is given in a microscope one tilt is about 40 degree another tilt they call it as a beta this is about of the order of uh, 30 degree okay this tilt covers most of the zones which we wanted to see in conventional in typical uh, cubic materials another thing which you should remember is that we are talking about uh, electron microscope electron beam which we have to use it that means that electron strongly interacts with matter it can get scattered and its energy can be lost so we require a very high vacuum so vacuum could be obtained using rotary pump diffusion pump turbo molecular pump gatrayan pump cryosorption pump there are various types of pumps which gives vacuum from around 10 to the power of minus 2 tor to about uh, 10 to the power of minus 9 tor of order vacuum could be generated in that sample these details you can see it in a book which i will not be going into okay but what is essentially important is that what is the order of vacuum which we require because all pumps are available which pump we should use for a particular system that is dictated by that is by the kinetic theory of gases if you understand that we can that is if molecules are moving okay even in this room because of the number of molecules which are there as they are traveling they as they travel in this direction they encounter an another molecule it collides with it okay we can find out what is the separation uh, average distance it travel it has to travel before it collides with it this is called as the mean free path for collision okay generally the term lambda is used to define this one should not uh, confuse it with wavelength of the radiation okay as we evacuate it the number of molecules get reduced the volume remains that same the mean free path increases the minimum vacuum should be that when an electron is emitted from a electron gun from the top okay from the filament till it reaches the photographic device okay the distance which it has to travel the mean free path should be larger than this distance so that puts the criterion if you look at that criterion maybe a vacuum of 10 to the power of minus 4 tor is good enough for it okay but what is going to happen is that when we examine that sample contamination of the sample can occur because electron beam is hitting on that if you contamination also occurs at some particular rate okay if you wanted to avoid that if we increase the vacuum to around 10 to the power of minus 8 minus 9 tor it takes a very long time for a monolayer to form over okay so that is how okay we can uh, so the two things one the requirement from the uh, detection side another is from the sample side and from the gun side they did, uh, put a condition on what sort of uh, Uh, vacuum which has to be used so that's why some differential vacuum is used in these cases this is the criteria for vacuum various techniques which are uh, to be covered okay all will be covered that is what are the various techniques which are available in the microscope and their brief principle and uh, operation and the theory will be covered in the rest of that course okay, i'll stop here now